Okay, welcome everybody to the RGS Global Seminar Series. I'm Hester Yiskot, I'm the Chief Editor of the Journal of Glaciology and the Annals of Glaciology. And today I will be chairing instead of TV because we have a very special seminar. It's the Graeme Cogley Award winners who will be speaking today. So welcome to everyone. It's in the middle of the day where I am. It's evening in Europe. It's in the middle of the night in India and it's very early in the morning in some other parts of the world. Um, so there's two Graham Cockley Award winners talks today and um, they will be talking each after each other and then we'll reserve the questions until the end. Um, so I also want to give a special welcome today to the widow of Graham Cockley, Kathy Cockley, who's joining us on this Zoom meeting. So first of all, what is the Graham Cockley Award? Well, the Graham Cockley Award was established in memory of Professor Graham Cockley for his substantial and enduring contributions to glaciology, especially to mass balance research. He was also an outstanding um, uh, service man to the IGS and the IASC and the wider glacial community over many years. And he actually was until his death, the IGS chief editor. So this award was established soon after Graham passed away and Kathy Cogley and the Cogley family contacted um, both the IASC and the IGS to state that they wanted to initiate this award and they're generously sponsoring the award. So the award is shared between the IGS and the IASC and in the even years it's the IGS and in the odd years it's the IASC that is um, awarding this award. So this is an even year 2020 and the IGS will give out two Graham Cockley awards to students or recent students who published papers in the two years previous to the award. They've published papers either in the Journal of Glaciology or the Annals of Glaciology that were exceptional of quality. So for this particular round, there were 70 eligible student authors' papers in the Journal of Glaciology and the Annals of Glaciology. And of those, the associate chief editors um, selected nine papers that they shortlisted list, of this whole group. And of these nine papers, we have two winners. If you want to know the exact kind of procedure there's on the IGS website, you can actually find out exactly what we all do for that. So the two award winners are Carlo Liciuli and Paul Weber, one who did his PhD at the University of Heidelberg and one who is still in the process of finishing his PhD at the University of Portsmouth in UK. And both these papers really nicely also honor the memory of Graham Cogley because it's a combination of new data assembly and understanding data fluctuations, uh, glacial fluctuations and mass balance. So for this award, the um, awardees get certificates. They also each get 500 uh, in Canadian dollars or in euros um, transferred to them. And this money is generally sponsored by the Graham Cogley family, um, especially Kathy Cogley has been um, very generous to give us the opportunity to do this. And that's the same thing with the IAX awards in 2019 and 2021 again. They are generously sponsored by the Cogley family. Um, the two award winners will also be recorded in the official award list. As we know, the IGS also has a Seligman crystal, for example, uh, Richardson's medal. So. This will be a new award that will be forever listed with the names of the award winners. And what we're trying to do is have these award winners present at a conference. And for example, the conferences usually are the international um, conferences in person. And now we have to do it over Zoom, but it's accessible to more people. So, um, 
without further ado, I am going to stop my screen share and have the first award winner, Carlo Licciulli. Um, if you can start sharing your screen. Okay, good. So Carlo is now at the, at the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities in the Department of Geology and Glaciology. He did his PhD between 2014 and 18 at the Institute of Environmental Physics at Heidelberg University. And his main supervisor was Olaf Eisen, who also joined Zoom, ISO. And um, other supervisors were Pascal Bolleber and Dietmar Wagenbach. Um, Carlo uh, received his bachelor and master's in physics from the University of Heidelberg as well. And he moved from particle physics to glaciology. So we're very happy to have Carlo with us today. And um, you can start your talk now. <laughs> yeah, hi, hi everyone. And thank you for the, for the nice words and nice introduction. I'm really glad uh, to have the possibility to present here the, the study and I'm really, really happy that I got this award. It uh, was really, really a big surprise and a big thank you also to the family of Professor Cogley who initiated this, this award. Um, so the topic of the, of the paper is uh, full stocks ice flow modeling of the uh, glacier Colony Fetti, which is a high alpine glacier. And um, a picture of this glacier you can see on this slide and from the, taken from the Italian side with the, the Margarita hut on top of it, which is the highest hut in Europe and a very nice place to be. Um, before I start with a real talk, uh, I would like also to thank uh, all people contributed to the, uh, or supported me for the PhD thesis and also for the publication. And there are of course more than these people, but this one I listed here which are my advisors, uh, all the co-authors of the, of the paper, and uh, all the student uh, PhD and master student who were in Arbeck in the same time I was doing my PhD. Thank you very much to you, and uh, this award also, uh, this, piece, this piece of award is also your award. And so now I can move to, to the actual talk. Um, so um, Colony Fetti is a very particular drilling site. It's a very particular glacial because it's uh, probably the only one in the European Alps who can offer, has the potential to offer millennial scale uh, ice core records. And um, this is maybe not much compared to Greenland or Antarctic uh, ice cores, but it's really a lot if you consider this is in the middle of Europe and mid latitudes and uh, very close to a high populated area. So really inter interesting location for uh, paleoclimatic research. And, um, for this reason, a um, lot of ice cores have been drilled and recovered up, up there. And uh, here in this table, I'm listing the, the most important where my former institution, the IUP Heidelberg was involved. Uh, here in the table and here on the glacier. And in particular, the ice core PCC uh, and KCI uh, are for, for this type of relevance because that's the most recent one. So really high potential this study, but also connected uh, with uh, uh, quite uh, big challenges uh, because the, the glaciological conditions are not too easy. Uh, we have the positional noise, rather complex for regime up upstream effects, um, which makes the interpretation of these uh, records quite difficult. But I will come to that in the next slides. First, I would like to introduce the, the glacier itself, um, which is a rather small glacier a few hundred meters by few hundred meters, located at a four and a half thousand meter altitude. Um, is a, is a cold glacier, a uh, thin saddle. Uh, thickness is not that thick, uh, at most uh, not exceeding uh, 100 meters. Uh, because of the low temperature is frozen to bedrock. And um, so the particularity is the very strong, at this location is very strong wind erosion um, which is uh, uh, is origin on the on the shape and the orientation of the glacier. Uh, so the glacier is the shape of a saddle, a saddle which is spanned between two uh, peaks of Monte Rosa. You can see the peaks also here: Signal Kuppe and Zumsenspitze, and here is the saddle. And um, uh, the main axis of this saddle coincides with the prevailing wind direction. And downwind of this uh, is an ice cliff. So most of the precipitation 
is just um, blown away across this ice cliff, which is a sort of sink and can never come back. So um, the, the net accumulation is really, really low at the end, much lower than the precipitation rate. So low accumulation means also thin annual layers. And this together with the fact that uh, it's frozen to the bedrock uh, leads to really long, uh, long-term ice core records. But as I said, um, the interpretation of those records is quite difficult because of uh, upstream effects and other stuff. And in particular upstream effects, I would like to explain a bit more. Um, so the accumulation, as I said, is wind induced, therefore it's uh, highly irregular in space and time. And we can have some systematic pattern that can form. And uh, for example, uh, so the, the cores are uh, recovered from the saddle region. So from, from this part, but the source regions of the cores is here up on this slope region where the depositional condition are actually completely different. So here, because of the, of the slope and also because it's a north oriented slope, the wind erosion is really efficient. So here, the, uh, going up to this region, the accumulation is decreasing. And if we have accumulation, it's most likely during summer or during warmer days. So we have also coming up here an increasing summer bias. Um, this produces so-called upstream effects, which has to be taken account for a proper interpretation of the ice core records. And the only way to do this is to, is to have a numerical ice flow model, uh, which has to calculate backward trajectories from the drilling site, uh, locate as precise as possible the source regions, and this is the only way how to uh, quantify those upstream effects. So I hope I could uh, somehow explain why calling effect is important and why do we need the model. Uh, now I would like to, to present the model. And um, so the, the model area is uh, here highlighted in red. Uh, important boundaries are here in the west, uh, big crevasse, and on, in, in the east, uh, the ice cliff that I already talked about. And uh, in the south, uh, in the, at the end of the, of the slope, so upstream of the core area is a back shroud, uh, which is right below Capana Margarita. Uh, the ice cores are all concentrated in this north oriented part of the glacier, because this is an interest, interesting part of, of the glacier with the, which is north oriented for low accumulation and which can provide long term ice core records. Um, data that uh, I can use for the model are surface velocity and surface topography, uh, GPR tracks, which are used for the better topography. Uh, ice core derived data like density profile, chronologies, fabric information. Uh, we have also quite a lot of temperature profiles and for some boreholes also bore inclination angle. I will explain later how do I, I use this. Uh, the approach of the model is 3D and full stokes. Um, the model is uh, fully thermomechanically coupled. I consider fear rheology for the deformation since a, a big amount of the, um, of the glacier is made of fear. Uh, thermodynamic is the, taken into account using ent entropy transport and the implementation is done using Elmer ice, which is based on fine element method. And the main assumptions are two. One, that uh, we have the uh, mechanical steady state, uh, so not thermodynamical steady state, but mechanical. So uh, we assume that the glacier doesn't change its shape, uh, its geometry during the years. And this is true at least for the last hundred years where we have pictures. The other assumption is um, no slip basal conditions or the, the glacier is frozen to the bedrock. And this is a, this is a realistic assumption the temperature is really low. Um, about the physics behind, everything is based on conservation laws it's from the momentum conservation, the Stokes equation, then the continuity equation, and then the entropy transport equation. So we have a direction term, diffusion term of heat, and then two source terms, one because of deformational heat, uh, one, because of latent it, uh, if there are some hot days in summer where a few bit of uh, melting can be produced and from refreezing, this, this is a source of heat. Uh, in order to close the system, uh, we need also a constitutive equation and I use, as I said already before, one for compressible film, uh, which uh, was introduced uh, for the first time for, uh, by Gallardini and Messonnier. Maybe a few words. Um, about the thermodynamic boundary condition. Uh, first at surface, where we have um, um, some uh, steady temperatures, which I use for the spin up. 
which are estimated looking at the measured temperature profiles. And on top of this, uh, for the real simulation, then I sum up the temperature deviation, which are different from each year that are known from some uh, meteorological station or stuff like this. Uh, this for the last hundred years. And uh, on top of this, I also sum uh, Latin heat, which uh, is sometimes released, uh, which is also based on this time series and is calculated using a simple degree day model. And uh, on, the, on the base of the, of the glacier, we have uh, another heat flux, uh, which is also estimated look at the temperature profiles, which are measured and is about 30 to 45 milliwatt per square meter. So before coming to the uh, important results, so the calculation of back trajectories, uh, first I show uh, some results which are required for to, in order to validate the model. And uh, first at surface, surface velocities. Um, black arrows are the model results and the red arrows are the measurements. And in particular in the central part of the, of the, of the glacier where the, um, where the ice cores are recovered, so the interesting part of the glacier, the, the match is, is, is quite good. Um, in addition to this, another way to, um, to validate the velocity field close to surface is to have a look at, at the surface accumulation. And this I can do <coughs> using the free surface equation. Uh, since I assume steady state, I can use this equation uh, to calculate the accumulation which is required every year in order to have steady, steady conditions. And the result is here in this plot. And uh, also qualitatively looks, looks as expected. We have uh, quite low accumulation in the slope region, uh, close to the back zone, in the direction of Capana Margarita here. We have also uh, quite uh, low accumulation close to the ice cliff and a bit more accumulation in, in the central area of the, of the saddle. And if I compare this with the uh, um, GPR de derived accumulation, so with measurements, uh, it, it also looks like that the model is able to reconstruct the, uh, about the, the accumulation regime of the, of the glacier. Another thing that we can do is also, now we have had a look at the surface, now we would like to have a look in, in the glacier body how, if the model is able to reconstruct, uh, to, to, to provide realistic results. And for this, we can have a look at borehole inclination. So we have, uh, we had during my PhD, uh, two boreholes which are still accessible. And uh, by measuring the inclination of those boreholes, uh, is it possible to estimate how much is the deformation inside the glacier body? And for this, I need so to, cut, to measure the angles, the inclination of the boreholes. And I use this inclinometer probe. And um, the measurement are not trivial actually, uh, are quite difficult because I never know um, how is the positioning of the probe inside the borehole. Uh, I hope it is parallel to the borehole walls, but it can also not be like this. So for this, uh, we put some uh, centralizers, but still we see in the results that uh, this, um, these measurements are affected by quite large errors. And here I'm showing uh, the case of uh, one borehole where it worked quite well. This is the borehole KCI, which is very close to the ice cliff. And uh, it worked well because this, this borehole is qu was quite old, to, drilled in 2005 and measured 11 years later. So uh, there was quite a lot of time uh, to deformate for this borehole. So there was quite large signal that was a bit easier to measure. And um, the assumption is that the, the borehole was a straight vertical line uh, just after drilling. And then with the model, I simulate um, the evolution of this uh, of this borrow after 11 years. And uh, then I calculate the angles and uh, I compare with the measurement here. The measurements are the red and blue dots and uh, which are done uh, letting the probe downwards in the borehole and then upwards again. And you see there is a mismatch in this, although the, the measurements are performed half an hour later. And this is because of the uh, uncertainty, uh, difficulty in the measurement that I was uh, speaking before. And, but um, if you compare this with, um, uh, with the model results, I have three methods to calculate the angles. Uh, you see that uh, we, are, we are in the same range. So it looks, it looks like that the model uh, is able to reconstruct uh, angles, uh, inclination angles of, uh, of boreholes. Um, 
further, I, as I said before, I calculated also the density field of the glacier, since, since it is a fully coupled uh, model, and uh, compared this with the uh, um, uh, ice core density profiles. And uh, here also fits quite well. I don't want to spend too much words here. Uh, similar for the temperature profiles, uh, the, the model is able to reconstruct the temperature profile, which is not surprising uh, because I uh, adapted the, uh, adjusted the, the pa parameter of the thermodynamic model in order to achieve this, since the goal is to have a um, temperature field which is as realistic as possible. And this is the case as shown by this diagram. So then after the validation, now can, I can use the model uh, to, uh, to answer the question that, that we have about upstream effects. So I calculated trajectories, backward trajectories from the uh, drilling sites. Uh, looks like this, using the runge kuta method, which was implemented in Paraview. And uh, an aerial view of this is here. Uh, the red dots are the source points and um, the number on the side are the corresponding depths in the borehole. About arts and scientists, uh, these uh, were estimated by using different petrol topography, which is, uh, we believe this is the, the, the highest uncertainty that we, that we have in this study. And it comes up that at the end that um, the uncertainty is about 10% of the distance from the corresponding uh, borehole. Uh, that means in case of KCC, the ice core that we care more, um, is maximum uh, error of 10 to 50 meters, which is uh, good enough for a proper uh, investigation of upstream effects. And this is what we did here. Uh, we tried to make this quantification. Uh, to calculate this, uh, we need uh, the um, uh, source location that I showed before. And then in principle, I need um, at the source points, uh, a typical value of delta 18O uh, or the difference of this value from the drilling site. But since we don't, we don't have measurement exactly at this point, then we did uh, something different. We looked for a correlation between uh, surface accumulation and delta 18O, which is expected since uh, this was what I, what I was saying at the beginning. Uh, in, in the slope region, we have strong wind erosion, low accumulation, and some abyssed accumulation. So this correlation exists, and, this, uh, and we found this correlation in, in previous works on, the, on this flank of Colony 50. Uh, the results can be seen here. Uh, here is the ice core depth for both KCC and KCI, and um, uh, the corresponding uh, accumulation at source, which is getting lower, going further up, uh, in, in the slope, in the direction of, of the back shunt. And, uh, and then this accumulation is converted into delta, typical delta 18 uh, values. And you see that the maximum um, shift of delta 18 value is in general less than two per mil, so not that much. <clears throat> and then we applied this correction to a real um, time series. Uh, here is the, the record, Delta 18 record uh, measured at KCC for the last thousand years. Uh, the measure record is the red line and the corrected one is the, is the blue one. And um, yeah, this, this, this is the goal. This, this was the goal of the study. Uh, but of course it is interesting if we now have a working model or at least a model which looks like to work <coughs> to, to do more than this. And so we had also look on, uh, on ice core chronologies, uh, if we tried to, to make some dating. Uh, this can be done in two ways. Uh, one, um, just using the backward trajectories I uh, presented a few slides before, uh, integrating them. The other possibility is um, solving the dating equation, which is an advection equation. And um, so I did this for uh, all five ice cores that we considered. And for four out of five uh, was working uh, very well. So it was, the results were uh, in, in accordance with experimental dating results. And here I'm showing the case for KCC, which is, which is was uh, the most interesting case. <coughs> so the um, red and yellow lines are the model results. 
and which are compared with the uh, annual layer counting, which are the which is the blue line, and also with C14 measurements, which are the green dots. Um, if we see uh, down to 45 meters, about model results are well in agreement with um, um, annual layer counting, but going below. Uh, the layer counting chronology is, is much older than the model results. Much older, but consistent with C14 measurements. Then something at six meter, 60 meter depths, something really interesting happens. Uh, we see that uh, the C14 chronology has a discontinuity, so a jump towards younger ages, which, is, which was really surprising seeing this. Um, we don't really know how the well, do we have this? But the interesting thing is that uh, below this 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 depth, the um, the C fourteen measurement and then in agreement with the model results, which is um, quite strong um, validation of the model and also of maybe also also of the C fourteen measurement, uh, because this this method are completely independent and but they, they provide quite similar results in the very bottom part of the, of the core. So it's, it's, it, it was nice to see this. Um, so as I said, we don't really know what is, what's going on in this area, but um, um, we can do some hypothesis. And uh, one hypothesis has to do with the folding eyes. So it can be that uh, uh, we have folds and we know this is a, a famous uh, radogram from, from Greenland. Uh, we know it's possible that uh, uh, we have folds in the eyes. Uh, however, these folds are on a completely different scale. Here's a kilometer scale. In calling it would be at most meter scale. Uh, but if we see at the, this is a picture of the ice cliff of calling it and we make a zoom. Yeah. Um, it is possible to see that some, some layers looks like they are folded. So it, it, it is a realistic uh, hypothesis to think that could be a fold this. But uh, yeah, we, we don't know if it is a fault. Um, another hypothesis, um, maybe this, uh, this discontinuity has something to do with, uh, with the background. The background is uh, this sort of crevasse, uh, which is uh, in the upstream part, in the upstream part of the glacier, uh, in the direction of Capana Margarita. And uh, the, the background is sometimes open, sometimes closed. And so it can, it can be that it somehow disturbs the, uh, the stratigraphy or maybe put in together some layers which are different ages. However, if we believe in model results, the discontinuity is about 60 meters uh, in depth and this corresponds to a source point which is far below the background. So it looks like there is no causal connection, but it can be that uh, we don't know in the past, maybe the position of the background was somewhere else, maybe further downstream. So we cannot exclude this and this for sure, also something interesting to, to model for the future to have for future work. Yeah, and this is about what uh, I wanted to say. Um, so I hope I could make clear why Colony Fett is such an interesting glacier and why do we need an ice flow model uh, for a better interpretation of the ASCO records. The mod model was validated by comparison with different observables, and uh, the most important results are the calculate the backward trajectories, which are useful for the quantification of upstream effects, which we did for the first time. And the model was also used for ice core dating. And there is, of course, big room for improvement of model results. For example, we could consider new physical processes, like the consideration of rubber close-off in the fin flow, as well as uh, we know we have ice an uh, anisotropy at this glacier, which influenced the rheology, would be nice to implement also this. However, we believe that the, the most important improvement we could get is if we, we uh, could constrain better the, the geometry of the glacier. That means better topography and software topography. This is from my side everything what I want to say, and I thank you for watching. Thank you very much, Carlo. That was a really good example of assembling a large amount of really diverse data and like combining some things for the first time. And this is also the case with our next speaker who does it in a very different way, but it also involves field work and um, they, like independence data collection. And I think both of you have developed some new methods that are examples for other people to use in the future. So, Paul, if you can start 
sharing your screen. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation now. Um, yes, thank you, Hester, for this introduction. And uh, thank you to the IGS and Catherine Copley for uh, presenting us or presenting me and my um, co-authors with this award. Um, because my co-authors, which are also, or three of them are my PhD supervisors, um, without their I don't know how much time they spend revising this paper to to get it to this um, yeah to this level um, that really deserves also a lot of credit. Um, so yeah, um, I look at historical maps and how to produce a glacier inventory from historical maps. Um, my co-authors are Liz Andreasen from the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate in Norway. Uh, Claire Boston and Harold Lovell from the University of Portsmouth. Harold is my main PhD supervisor and we had um, considerable uh, support from the Norwegian Mapping Authority, which helped us, us with all the archival work. And um, glacier inventories for Norway and Nuland. Um, or oh, let me first start uh, to introduce Nuland to you. Nuland is a county in Northern Norway it has a size of approximately 38,000 square kilometers, which is just below the size of Switzerland. So it's a substantial um, land area. Um, and it also is home to a substantial amount of glaciers. Svartisen, Blomansisen are just uh, three of the largest glaciers in this county. And complete glacier inventories exist for Norway and Nuland for three periods of time. And these are the 1960s, the 1990s, and the 2000s. And um, the last two inventories were created from Landsat satellite imagery, and the 1960 inventory was created from topographical maps based on aerial photographs. And all these three inventories uh, actually span um, a time period, so they're not just uh, limited to a year. Um, and there's a new inventory of Norwegian glaciers forthcoming. Uh, Liz Andreasen at NV is working on it using 2018-2019 uh, satellite imagery. Um, but for now, the last up-to-date data is only available for around 2000, and this data and this data uh, said that Muulan had a glacier area of 906 square kilometers, which again is um, just below the uh, glacier area of Switzerland. So as I said before, Muulan is really a, a quite important area with glacier ice. Um, and it also hosts around one third of the entire glacier area of Norway which in around 2000 was 2,700 square kilometers. Um, it, oh, if we go back in time, um, in the era before satellites and, and vertical aerial photographs, we have to rely on historical maps to produce glacier inventories. And in Norway so far, this has only been done for, for a couple of plateau ice fields um, five ice fields in northern Norway and one ice field in southern Norway. And the aim uh, with our study was to produce a more regional scale inventory, not just of individual ice fields. And the aim was to then apply this inventory in a centennial scale glacier change assessment so that we can actually see um, or quantify um, the amount of or the amount of glacier change that has happened between around uh, 1900 and 2000. And as soon as we have a new updated glacier inventory um, for the early 21st century, we can of course have an even longer term assessment of glacier change in Norway and Nordland. So we used a historical map series called Gratex Scott, um, translated into English, um, it would be quadrangle maps. They have a scale of one to 100,000. And the production of these maps started in the late 19th century. 
and they became uh, quickly Norway's main map series. And they were Norway's main map series until the 1950s. And each map sheet is defined by lines of latitude and longitude. And these, this area that is defined by these lines of latitude and longitude are called Gratoik in Norwegian. And as I said, uh, translated into English, it would be quadrangle. Um, and the prime meridian goes through Oslo. Norway, which you can see here on the right hand side of my slide, is covered by 44, uh, 40, 54 map sheets, and uh, 33 of them uh, show glacier ice. And you see all these 33 uh, maps on, in the figure on the right hand side. And these maps were surveyed in the field between 1882 and 1960, so over a period of 34 years, which can't be compared to modern day um, um, glacier mapping where satellites um, really uh, cover large areas of, of land just within days. Um, and our second aim was um, to examine if these maps were accurate to be a suitable glacier inventory. Um, and um, you might be wondering why I use this as my second aim um, and why shouldn't I start with this? Um, and that's because, because um, we actually um, look or examine the accuracy of our maps um, before, during, and after the production of our glacier inventory. So the paper is really all about assessing uncertainties uh, and it's really the main focus of our paper. And the, um, the glacier change assessment is very interesting, but really is only a secondary um, aim. And um, in the end of our paper, we give recommendation for other researchers of how to produce glacier inventories from historical maps. Um, and I want to turn this a bit around and use this as a starting point. I want to use my recommendations to guide you through our paper. And um, I, of course, realize that there are not so many um, historic map series out there that our paper might uh, stimulate a huge amount of research now. But for uh, other people out there interested in, in using historic maps to produce glacier inventories, have a look out, uh, at our recommendations and maybe you find them useful. Um, just to introduce these recommendations very quickly, um, um, the first recommendation is that you have to assess the overall map quality and the accuracy of the map glaciers, even before you start producing the inventory. Then during the production of, of the inventory, it's important that all the uncertainties related to the GIS methods, you to the GIS methods you apply um, are quantified. And our third recommendation is that um, any glacier inventory uh, produced from historical maps should be validated against independent data sets. And I'm going to um, give more details on every one of these three uh, recommendations throughout my talk. So the first recommendation, uh, as I just said, is that you have to assess the uh, quality of the maps and in particular whether or not um, the ice masses depicted on the maps are, are accurate. And this could, for example, include um, that you look at historical survey instructions or survey reports or photographs that were um, taken during the production of the maps. And this was our first step. So before we even started to produce the inventory in the GIS, we did a lot of archival work, which you basically can compare to a detective. Um, we looked at old um, survey instruction and looked at how these maps were actually created. And these maps were created by uh, plane tabling and this is pretty straightforward. As you can see here in the middle picture, um, the surveyors would go out into the field and they would place a plane table um, on a tripod uh, and with a drawing sheet on top. And then they would use this um, elidate here to uh, cite objects of interest and draw them into the uh, drawing sheet. Then during this, would, they would do this during the, from beginning in spring, summer, and throughout the autumn until snow condition would make it impossible to do any mapping. And during the winter, they would spend their time 
um, using these drawing sheets to compile them into nice and clean survey maps, which you can see, see here on the right hand side. They were hand drawn and um, they were the basis to create the actual final map sheets, which are produced in color and which you can see here um, on the bottom. So we also went through a lot of old survey reports because uh, in addition to the mapping, the topographer produced detailed description of the land and its natural features, including the glaciers. And this is very important because um, as I mentioned before, our aim was to actually um, assess whether or not the maps can be used as a glacier inventory. So an important point is to make sure that the glaciers on the maps are really accurate and not just um, sketches or, or more like um, fantasies, basically. Um, and uh, we looked into these old reports and I just wanna um, show one example here. Um, as you can see, they're all handwritten and it's like quite, it took quite a lot of work to, to actually decipher them. Um, and one of the uh, surveyors uh, in around 1900 um, surveying this mountain area, which you can see here on his survey map, um, he actually wrote about his work um, that there is no noteworthy everlasting ice and snow, although I have marked down some small patches in Nurskore and Surskore, in some other places, for instance at Kurschwiktin, I could not determine whether or not the snow will disappear over the course of the summer and have not marked down any glaciers. So this is very important evidence that the surveyors actually um, um, looked at glaciers in a way that we as a glaciologist would do and they mapped them accurately. If you look at the map, um, the surveyor only mapped a couple of glaciers here in the Surskore and the Norskore Valley, as he described in his description. But at Korsvikten, in the mountain up here, he wasn't sure whether it's really snow or whether it's ice, uh, snow-covered ice. So he was very careful and conservative in his approach, and um, he then didn't map anything. So the conclusions from our work are here that the surveyors differentiated between snow and ice, but probably not between glaciers and perennial snow. Um, but the mapping was carried out carefully and in a conservative manner. So as I said, if the surveyor wasn't sure if, if it was ice or snow, he, he rather didn't map it in. And um, this is confirmed by survey photographs because each um, topographer also took a camera into the field and um, took pictures of the surveyed landscape, often from the same location from where the, um, um, the surveys were carried out. And um, you can see here in these three photographs that all the mountain sites, all the valley sites are covered by snow, um, maybe with ice underneath, but due to the conservative mapping approach only the most prominent feature here in panel D on top of the mountain was mapped in as a glacier. All these um, snow bodies in panel B and D, uh, in panel B and C, sorry, were not mapped. And another example is here, this outlet glacier of the uh, Blomann season ice cap. Um, you see here on this photograph, this very prominent um, pro-glacier meltwater pond uh, and stream, and this stream was um, depicted in quite some detail at the final map sheet, so we can be sure that the surveyors really accurately mapped um, the landscape and the glaciers. Um, so based on our topographic descriptions and the photographs and all the evidence we had available, we could conclude that the maps are an acceptable data source for a glacier inventory. And we could now actually begin our GIS work and to actually produce the glacier inventory. Um, and here we make a second recommendation, which is that all the uncertainties um, that is, are associated with the GIS-based production of a glacier inventory should be quantified and combined in a total inventory uncertainty so that you have error terms for the glacier area. And um, we started producing our glacier inventory by georeferencing the maps because there were just scans of the analog maps. 
Um, so this was um, traditional georeferencing in a GIS. We use 10 control points per map sheet on average uh, to do this. Um, first to third are the polynomial transformations and our, uh, our root mean square hours were quite low. So that means that our georeferencing had a high quality and um, the maps had now a um, modern day coordinate system. If we look at the uh, quality of our georeferencing, I want to show you how the historic maps match with modern day map data. So you see here on the right hand side, a modern day topographic map. Uh, we use this map to actually georeference the maps. Um, and now I'm going to lay the old historical map on top. And you can see how nicely the historical map matches up with the um, topography uh, of the um, modern day map. And I want to show this again, um, have a look at the shoreline of the fjord, uh, how nicely the two actually match up. Um, but also have a look at this upland area down here, which today doesn't host uh, any glaciers, basically only a couple of ice patches here. But in around 1900, this upland area hosted a substantial ice cap or plateau ice field. So um, our georeferencing work is further proof that the maps are actually of high quality and can be used in the glacier inventory. And now this was the hardest part because our 33 Newerland maps contained, contained more than 1,400 glaciers. So we had to digitize 1,400 glacier bodies. Um, and of course, the challenge here is that this is not, um, that this is just an, an ordinary image file. It's not multispectral data like, like satellite images today where we can use automated image classification. Um, we had to actually do this by hand or find another method which would be more uh, time efficient. And here we used um, that the um, image files or the map files uh, use the uh, red, green, blue color system because red, green and blue use eight bits each and each has integer values from zero to 255. And we used a graphics editor because graphics editors have a really nice tool which can identify image pixels based on these integer values. And um, we can apply a threshold, um, which means that we can select pixels with similar color values automatically. And this is what we have done. Um, if we look at, we, we use two different thresholds. We used a threshold of 10 color values and a threshold of 15 color values. The problem with the historical maps was that um, they have quite a blurred transition from the glacier area to the surrounding terrain, which made it quite challenging, challenging for our automatic selection to actually select only pixels that are glacier ice. So here you can see that our automated or our threshold of 10 and 15 color values also included terrain beyond the glacier margin uh, and only along the mountainside here where we have the clear color contrast between the, between the turquoise glacier ice and the uh, brownish terrain. Um, here our automated image classification worked really nicely, but in other parts um, not so much and we had to spend some considerable amount of time to post-process our outlines to make them um, pixel accurate. And we estimate that our pixel accurate outlines, um, and that the uncertainty is only one row of pixels around our outlines. And one pixel is around nine meter. Um, so uh, applying a buffer of nine meter for all of our glacier um, polygons changed the glacier area by 4%. And we use these 4% as a representative value for our digitizing error. Um, the next error we try to quantify is what we call the map reproduction error. 
because these are maps which are 120 years old by now and um, the cartographers back then used quite a complex uh, workflow to produce actually the final map sheets. Um, I already introduced the survey maps which were hand drawn but it took actually one point or more than 1.8 years to produce the final map sheets from these survey maps. And um, they did this by um, using two techniques, photogravure and lithography. So um, first a drawing of the map was photographed and the negative transferred to a silver coated copper plate and etched in. Then um, the cartographers produced separate lithographic printing plates for the map colors. Um, and they used three map colors, these kind of beige tones for the uh, terrain, uh, turquoise for the glaciers and blue for water bodies. And each of these three colors needed a separate printing plate. And um, plus then of course the, uh, the photograph wood printing plate. So four printing plates were combined to produce one map sheet. And we, want, we were now interested if this very complex workflow had any impact on, on the glacier area displayed on the maps. And um, uh, which is why we digitized um, glaciers from uh, one survey map and from two uh, print versions of a final map sheet and compared the resulting polygons. And as you can see here, um, the red and the yellow is, uh, are the final map sheets in panel A and B. And you, you, oh, there's almost no difference between the two. Um, you only see the red right now because um, the yellow outline is actually just below the red um, because they're basically identical, so there's no difference. But what you can see that there's quite um, a noticeable difference between the printed or the final map sheets and the survey map, what you see here in blue. And um, we quantified this and found that there's a difference of 7% uh, in glacier area between the survey maps and the printed map sheets. And we use these 7% as a representative value to uh, quantify the map reproduction error. The final error we quantified uh, in our work um, during the production of the glacier inventories is the snow related errors because snow is uh, is a problem in glacier mapping. It can conceal the glacier margin and this can result in the exaggerated mapping of glacier outlines. And this is even a very um, big problem in contemporary glacier mapping from satellite imagery. Um, Frank Paul and Liz Andreasen estimated in their 2009 paper that this uncertainty or that snow might introduce an uncertainty of five to 10% for a large glacier with an area of five square kilometers and above, and as much as 25% for small ice bodies, which are smaller than one square kilometers. So snow is really a, a big source of uncertainty, both in contemporary glacier mapping and when we try to use historical maps. Um, and um, we found evidence that snow was also a problem um, during the his historical surveys. Um, in one of the survey reports, we found this note that this year, in 1905, the amount of snow in the mountains was particularly great because of the heavy snowfall last winter. So we have evidence that snow was already a problem when the surveyors in 1900 um, surveyed the glaciers. And we estimate that um, an uncertainty range uh, similar to that given by Paul and Andreasen is also realistic for our inventory. So we use a 15% uh, snow related error in our inventory to, to accommodate um, kind of this, this snow uncertainty. And now the final step um, was to combine all our three uncertainty values into one total inventory error. And here we use this very simple um, equation, which you can see here on the right hand side of my slide. Um, and combining these three uncertainty value gives a total inventory uncertainty of 17%. So the glacier area of our inventory um, has a 17% uncertainty uh, associated with it. 
And um, because I, uh, so before I'm going, uh, I'm going to show you our inventory in more detail in a minute. But I want to first I want to show you a final test, uh, and this is our third recommendation because um, we think it's a very good idea that before we use an inventory and glacier change assessment, that we test um, the outlines in our inventory independently with separate data sets. And um, here we used um, the Little Ice Age Glacier maximum extent. Um, the Little Ice Age was the cold period uh, from around 1400 to around 1900. And in many parts of the world, Glacier experienced a major expansion. And this was also the case in Nurland, where glaciers reached a maximum extent in around 1750. Um, there was a subsequent net retreat um, just until the beginning of the 20th, 20th century when the glacier started to re-advance again, but just for a brief period because from the 1930s, rapid glacier, glacier recession set in and um, glaciers retreated. And we're using this glacial history of Nuland to test um, our glacier outlines. And um, for our glacier outlines to be accurate, they have to pass a test. And this test or the criteria in this test is that the Little Ice Age glacier and maximum extent has to be greater than the glacier extent of our historical maps and the extent of the glaciers in 1900 as digitized from the historical maps has to be greater than the glacier extent in 1945, which is the period when we had very strong uh, glacier recession. And we produced um, outlines of the glacier extent for the Little Ice Age and 1945. And the 1945 outline was produced from um, aerial photographs and the Little Ice Age outline was produced based on geomorphological mapping in the field and from, from and remotely. And the Little Ice Age extent is, is, is very visible. You can see it right away. It's the yellow line here. And you see the remarkable difference in vegetation density between the Little Ice Age glacier fallen and the area beyond. So the Little Ice Age is very easily, or can be easily mapped in Norway. Um, and the um, red outlines you can see here are the 1945, um, is the 1945 glacier extent based on vertical aerial photographs. And we mapped, or we put all three of these um, on one um, satellite image. And, and as I said, to pass our test and for the glacier outlines to be accurate, um, they had to lie between the 1945 extent and the Little Ice Age as 10. And here at Fingerbrain, a large outlet glacier of the eastern Svartisen ice cap, you can see that our 1900 outline produced from historical maps passes our test. So we assume that this glacier outline is accurate because it is within the Little Ice Age limit, but outside the 1945 glacier extent. You can also see here this little valley glacier up in the north that um, this valley glacier also passes our test. The uh, 1900 outline produced from the historical map here in white lies between or within the little ice age limit but outside the 1945 image. But what you can also see is um, at this glacier just to the south. Here, the, the historic, the glacier extent digitized from the historical maps lies far beyond the Little Ice Age extent. And if we look at, at a photograph of the area, we can see the Little Ice Age extent is nicely delineated by, by moraines, um, which are indicated here by this, um, by this line. Um, the area within the Little Ice Age is vegetation free but outside it's dense, densely vegetated. And um, the map suggests here that the historical glacier outline went all the way down to this lake, which you can see here in the distance. But this is of course a clear mapping error because nothing here in the terrain suggests that this area was ice covered during the last 120 years. 
Um, you have the clearly lies edge extent, um, which is the maximum glacier extent um, for the last um, probably 300 years. And um, so the historical maps is clearly wrong in this place, now indicated in red. And um, you can also see that this area here to the south seems to be overestimated as well, because um, the historical glacier extent from the historical maps lies outside the Little Ice Age limit. Um, but what you can also see um, is here in the accumulation area of, the, um, of, this, uh, of these glaciers, because apparently um, this was not included at all in the 1900 um, glacier extent, which we digitized from the historical maps. Um, so clearly the surveyors seem to have forgotten to map this in, which we um, assume is because they had or they had this very conservative mapping approach. If they weren't sure if something is really glacier or snow, they didn't map it in. And this is what we think happened here. They probably were very careful and that's why they didn't map it in. Um, but basically what we can see here, our conclusion is that outlet glaciers, big outlet glaciers and big valley glaciers were mapped accurately. They pass our test and only smaller glaciers um, in very um, complex terrain in mountain areas, um, they fail our test here. But um, glacier overestimation uh, here indicated in red and glacier underestimation here indicated in green, they basically balance each other out. So we didn't include this in our total inventory error because they basically canceled each other out. Um, now on my almost my final slide, I want to show you the results of our glacier change assessment. Um, I spent now almost all the whole of my talk to explain all the uncertainties that we quantified um, to be sure that what we see here is actually real glacier change. And um, what our study suggests is that um, the glacier area in around 1899 was 1,713 square kilometers, um, plus minus around 300 square kilometers. This is our 17% inventory error. And um, by 2000, this area had, um, had um, decreased by 47%, um, which is almost half of, half of the glacier area in Newland is gone or yeah, has gone within 100 uh, years. The rate of recession was around 6% per decade, um, which is around 80 square kilometers. And also the number of glaciers has reduced significantly and they almost halved. Um, and this brings me to my conclusions. Um, and these are that we can use the historical maps of Newland to produce a glacier inventory. Um, but you have to assess the map accuracy carefully uh, to gain a realistic picture of the uncertainties that are associated with uh, map-based glacier inventories. But overall, our study demonstrates the value of historic maps for improving our understanding for 20th century glacier change. And as soon as an updated inventory for the 21st century is available, we can of course assess glacier change uh, over, an, over an even longer time period. And um, this brings me to my final words, which is to thank Catherine Cockley and the IGS again for um, presenting us with this award. Again, also on behalf of my supervisors. And um, yes, with this, I wanna give the word back to Hester who will introduce uh, next week's speaker. Thank you, really broad, and I think so. Applause to both of you. Um, so, if there are any questions, um, just uh, type a Q in uh, the chat, or just unmute yourself. We're on for people or for Carlo. Then.
so Hello? Can you listen to me? I'm muted. Paco has a question for Hi, Paco. We can hear you. Okay. Can you listen to me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Paco Navarro, IGS president. I would like first to congratulate to both uh, award winners to, um, uh, uh, for their impressive work and also to thank, well, the work, the talk, and of, of course, the nice papers. And also I would like to uh, thank the Kugli family for uh, their support to this uh, award. Then I have a question uh, for each of you. Maybe first to Carlo. Uh, question to Carlo is uh, about the tuning of the creep parameter for the ice and and, um, and fern. As I understood that you did for both. How did you do that? Um, as tuning, uh, the creep parameter, I just gave uh, temperature dependence that I got from the, from the literature. Uh, tuning was more for um, the boundary conditions and for the, for the thermodynamic model. And um, so boundary condition in principle, the, the geometry of the ice cliff and close to the, close to the crevasse, uh, which uh, are two areas which make where the glacier is very sensitive uh, for the velocity field. So I, I adjust them a bit that they, I can get a good velocity field. And then for the uh, thermodynamic parameter, um, I adjusted the look on the, on, the, on the measurements and I divided the, um, the, the boundary condition, these three terms that I showed and uh, a bit of feeling, then, then I got the, a good reconstruction of the temperature field. But for the parameter, I just used uh, literature results. Okay, thank you, and congratulations again. <laughs> and then the question for Paul is related to the to the error, and especially to the big magnitude of the snow-related error as compared to the digitalization error and the map reproduction error. And the particular question is uh, the fact that if in your case you had um, the snow-related was 15%, and then the total error finally was um, uh, was uh, 17. I think seventeen percent. And then uh, the question is: uh, Do you think, given the huge amount of work necessary for uh, estimating this digitalization error and the map reproduction error, do you think is it worth, not for your case, but I mean, let's think that the, someone else for another country would do the same thing. Do you think is it worth? Uh, to do such big effort just to get some uh, contributions which are expected to be so small? Or would you maybe uh, think or expect that these errors could be much larger in different uh, countries or settings? Yes, so our recommendation uh, was only um, that everyone who looks at historic maps um, should quantify the errors in general um, they don't have to use our error. So um, every historical map series is, I guess, a bit uh, unique. So in other countries, um, the condition might be completely different in how the glaciers were surveyed. So everyone has to find, or, or while working with the historical maps, they have to basically find, not their own errors, but they have to see what kind of sources of uncertainties uh, are contained in the maps and then quantify these uncertainties. Um, maybe they have a digitizing error, maybe not. Uh, it depends very much on the map series. Um, so our point was um, not that you necessarily have to use the um, uncertainties that we quantified, but the point is that you have to do it, that you should quantify uncertainties, whatever those uncertainties are. Mm -hmm. And in your particular case, did you anticipate that this uh, uh, such a big contribution from the snow-related error as compared to the other terms? Um, yes, um, because I mean we uh, we had there was this paper by Liz and and Paul Frank who estimated this, uh, and it's quite a problem in Norway because the glaciers are quite small, um, so snow can introduce a significant amount of error. 
Um, so it's, it's important for Norway. Um, but of course, in other glacier regions, it might be different. Um, maybe in the Himalayas, it might be debris. So um, yeah, it, it all depends on your map series and um, what, what, you, what kind of error or sources of errors you see in those maps. Okay, thank you. And congratulations again. I really enjoy the papers, both. Thanks. Thanks. To talk about other regions, we uh, forgot to introduce, not next week's talk, because there's going to be two weeks of interval. Uh, give everybody a bit of a holiday but as in Norway um, because they're also very fast fast change so everybody will see this uh, in the background there was a quarter wait uh, which I will just um, read now um, for Paul on the historic map the the same as on my um sorry we hear you quite uh, badly can you repeat your question uh, shall i uh read it it's on the chat i think uh lost it momentarily on the historic maps, the colour of water was the same as much of the glaciers. How did your red, green, blue classification separate these? Oh yeah, sorry, I was just about to answer the question in, in written form, but um, yes. Um, so the colours were distinct enough um, for our, um, or for the tool in this um, graphic editor to, to differentiate between the two. So the glaciers were like a beige turquoise colour and water bodies were more like a, a not dark blue, but more like a, a stronger blue color. And um, based on the uh, color values, the classification or the tool manage um, to separate the two. Um, but it often was just a bit of um, a bit of like trying and uh, try and fail. And so yeah, it was quite a bit of work to actually um, get this to work. And as we said, um, the um, um, the automatic uh, classification that we tried um, had um, quite some errors in it. So that's why we had to post-process all the outlines manually. Um, yes. So as Hester was saying uh, when she got to somewhat frozen, um, there's two weeks before our next seminar and our next seminar will be presented by Heather Purdy from New Zealand. Uh, the slide and the title up there, I'm not even going to begin to try and uh, uh, pronounce the Maori, but uh, the title is Morphological Evolution of Fox Glacier in New Zealand. Hester, I don't know whether there was anything you wanted to say to wrap up at all. Well, I'd like to thank um, both Carlo and Paul for really nice talks and everybody for attending this last series before uh, the little break. Thanks. <laughs> I think we've lost Hester somehow. So, um, I think we should just say uh, thank you very much to both our speakers uh, and congratulations again and uh, thank you very much to everyone uh, for attending, especially uh, Kathy Hogley. So thank you very much. And all. also give us some... So thanks everybody and see you in a couple of weeks time. <laughs>